Thank you so much, Sheree, for leading us in worship today. Would you take your Bibles? Would you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13, and as is our custom, when you get your place, would you just rest on your feet when you have your place? First Corinthians and the 13th chapter. Very familiar passage of scripture that I would like to end this Family Matters revival on. This is what the Bible says. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Please follow along with whatever version you have. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels but did not love others, I would only be a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of the God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love other people, I would be nothing. Verse 3, if I gave everything I have to the poor and sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Because love is patient and kind. I could stop right there. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Don't you hate when the Bible is so clear to you? It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. I'm struggling to read this verse. Love never gives up. Never loses faith. Is always... Hopeful. <laughs> and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Because now our knowledge is only partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we sing things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All I know is partial and incomplete. All I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Lord, have mercy. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for another chance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated in the Lord's house. For about two months now, we have been engaged in our Family Matters revival. Just wave at me if it's been a blessing to you. I began this year explaining how God had showed me in a very specific way to focus on families 
throughout this entire calendar year. So in January, we spent time dealing with family finances and realized in a fundamental way that regardless of how much or how little money you have, God owns it all. Next weekend, I'm going to start a new teaching series entitled, Parents Just Don't Understand. We quickly moved into the months of February and March, and every weekend receiving teaching on issues that impact the family in one way or another. While on Wednesday nights, God has been showing us how invested he is in our life, even in the area of dating. We learned that getting married has much more to do than just love, sex, or a wedding day, but has everything to do with spirituality, self-denial, and being sanctified through a lifetime of living with another person who has at least the same set of issues you have. Your pastor started this revival dealing with being set free from your past and how all of us need God to break the membranes around our life so the light of Jesus Christ can get in. Pastor Al Johnson followed and taught on the subject of siblings. It reminded us that the siblings we have in our life are there to strengthen our faith, not forever fight with. And the spirit of resentment, unforgiveness, and favoritism we have with or against our siblings is not from God. Elder Mangum came next with inspiring instruction on blended families. And I appreciated his timely teaching because how many of our families are living in blended families but have no teaching, help, or spiritual advice on how to navigate through it? Those of us who live in blended or mixed families could appreciate the tips, helpful insight, and transparent testimony through the word of God. And, and who can easily forget when we were blessed by the presence of Dr. John Trusty. I said, who could easily forget? Who, by the power of God, taught, instructed, helped, rebuked, enlightened, resolved, and enhanced our whole idea about this thing we call marriage. Pastor William Joseph graced us the second weekend of this month and open our eyes to the understanding of generational curses. Helping us to understand that because Jesus broke the curse of sin, we're not living under a perceived predestined bondage over our families unless we want to be. Because God is too big for our view to be so small of ourselves. So stop believing the lies, dry your eyes, quit rehearsing the sins of your parents that you feel you're an endless victim of, the season of your life when you're just walking in the wilderness and over, embrace what God has for you, accept your day's responsibilities, and leave your house saying, this joy I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My brother and friend, Pastor Eric Hatcher, came next with a relevant word directed toward our singles. I'm not sure what you remember from his teaching, but I was reminded of how many single believers attempt to do God's thing their way, but expect godly results. Because after all, there's an interesting yet not spiritually informed thinking today that says... I can come to the conclusion of what I want based on my own feelings, and I can find a text to back up what I innately want to do anyway. And then last week, finally, Minister Ronnie Vanderhorst helped our understanding on how to be a kingdom parent. <laughs> what a joy it was to realize the awesome privilege of being a parent in the kingdom of God, but a sobering reality to know that in order to be a kingdom parent, Jesus got to be birthed inside of us. Our church, you got to say, has been abundantly blessed over the last two months with instruction concerning the families and the pressing needs as it relates to our families. 
But as we conclude this revival strategically on Resurrection Weekend, I want to press your mind to another group of people that we are not biologically related to, but a group of people who can be the source of great joy, but also the subject of great pain, church family. Because you can choose your bio, you can't choose your biological family, but you have unlimited choices in where you want to fellowship with believers. It has been a place of discovery for me to notice how many people, I'll be honest, I have myself, how many people have been blessed by, helped, inspired, and nurtured by their church family, but also a real rough journey seeing a similar amount of people who were hurt, rejected, talked about, lied on, or misguided, or, and I didn't mean to hurt you, but don't help heal you attitude by church family. Because it would be a terrible thing if we've been on the side or been the cause of some people's greatest pain to the point where it's hard for them to see the hand of God moving in their life because your hand, which stood as God's representative, has smeared the image of God. So around this point in the sermon, where most of you are responding like the disciples, asking yourselves if you're the one who has started the ball rolling down the hill of negativity for someone's life, in your misplaced quest to hold up a so-called standard in Jesus' name. And the fact that you've pondered this question lets me know that on some level, you have misrepresented God to people so that even on this resurrection weekend, they can't celebrate the fact that our Lord got up because their life continues to resemble a tomb. Can I talk to somebody for a moment who's actually been hurt by somebody in church and, and, and first say to you, no, it wasn't right that they did you wrong. Yes, they have been in church longer than you and they should be more mature than the way they're acting. No, God was not pleased by their insensitive words, cold shoulders, and cross looks. However, you can't let people keep you from experiencing everything that Jesus wants you to have. Can I say that one more time? You, I, I don't care how mean somebody was to you. I know they hurt you. The hurt was real. The hurt was honest. But you can't let people who don't control your destiny control your mind, your heart, and your soul. Don't you dare let somebody who didn't free you from sin die on a cross or get up with resurrection power keep you from where you want to be. Can I stay here for just a quick second and let somebody know who was hurt by somebody in church? Don't you dare let somebody who didn't die for you and bleed for you and save your soul keep you. I wish I would need you to be nice to me to feel like I had a good day. I wish I would need you to be nice to me to feel like I had purpose and I was called. I wish I would need you to be nice to me, to pat me on the back. You can call me out my name. You can cuss at me because your success ain't determined by you. Don't, 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 you, don't, you, don't you dare, don't you dare let people who don't control your destiny keep you stuck on stupid and parked on. Don't you, I wish I would need you to roll your eyes to keep me away from Jesus. Because whether or not you like me has no bearing on who died for me. I wish, can I, can I stay here for a few minutes and let somebody know that the resurrection power of God is so potent and powerful that you can cuss me out in church and I'm still going to be saved. I will, our church, 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 church family Having problems is not a new issue. But back in the day, there was a church 
in the city of Corinth. The city itself was a major trade route, had a thriving economy. People would travel far and wide just to experience the city. The architecture was famous. Athletic games were held there. By the end of the second century, Corinth had become one of the richest cities in the world. But Corinth was a very pagan city. Heathen customs were in abundance. It, it was so crazy there that in Corinth, they had temples where you can go get prostitutes. They, 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 had, they had religious centers for people where you could really go to church to sleep with somebody. Because in Corinth, they worship pleasure more than they valued principle. So Paul, the Apostle Paul starts a new church in this city, stays for about 18 months, and leaves people to take care of the ministry. When he leaves, he gets multiple reports that this church is having issues with each other. So this letter, this 1st and 2nd Corinthians, is a letter to the church in Corinth in response to words he had received and counsel on how to maneuver and navigate through their church family struggles. He opens a letter talking about divisions because there were people in the church who were arguing about, I know we don't have this today, but they were arguing about whose ministry was best between Paul, Apollos, and Stephen. They, they actually took time to complain about which ministry leaders they enjoyed best. I, it, I, I know this don't happen today. This don't happen in no church in this area. This don't even happen here in Bladensburg. But back in the day, Carl, they used to sit around and argue about I like him best because he, when he preached, he really get to me. I like the way she leads best because she really talked to me. They were sitting around arguing, not about Jesus, but about whose ministry they like best. He, he continues in chapter 5 because this is really crazy. There's a member in the church who's having sexual relations with his wife's mother, with, with his father's wife, and catch this. The whole church know about it, but ain't nobody saying nothing about it, but everybody's talking about it. it it's, a dude, it's a dude in the church who's messing around with his stepmother. This, this is the Bible. This is chapter 5. He's messing with his stepmother, and nobody is saying anything about it, but everybody... It's don't, don't, don't look at me, don't look at me like that though because how many times have people in churches gotten into sticky sexual situations but instead of seeking the face as a church family to God, we are content with gossip, Sabbath lunch conversations and after meeting meetings to discuss not how we're going to restore somebody but how by the grace of God he can live. I'm so tired of folk in church that like to talk about stuff more than prayer. When are we going to get to the point when an issue or problem arises, we don't talk about it, but we go on our face and on our knees and say, God, you got to deal with this because this thing is so serious. If you don't do it, it's not going to get right. He, he continues... This word might not be for everybody today. I know it's for somebody. He continues, chapter 6, responding to questions about what they can do with their bodies because sexual immorality was a major attraction in Corinth and the people in the church wanted to do what people outside the church were doing. You, you, you missed it. I'm going to say it one more time. You slow, but you were waiting on. The folk in the church wanted to pleasure themselves the same way that people outside the church wanted to do. Folk outside the church was having sex with people they wasn't married to. So folk in the church says, why can't we do that too? Folk outside the church was looking at pornography and they, and they, they had girlfriends and boyfriends on the side. So the folk in the church said, we want to do that too. 
Folk outside the church says, it's my body and it's my thing. I can do what I want to do. I'm dating myself. And so folk inside the church says, why can't we do the same? So Paul writes back and says, don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Or don't you know that the person who joins himself to a harlot is one with her body because the two become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one in spirit? So flee immorality. Or don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is inside of you, who you have from God, and that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Can I tell somebody that just allows anybody to treat your body the way that you want them to and the next time somebody comes to you and says I want to do something with your body you say no 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 this belongs to God he continues I ain't got much I'm almost done in chapter 12 addressing the fact that people in the church were arguing because of the gifts they got from God I can see if you started the gift but you got it from him so they started saying things like this watch this watch this I think it's more important if I sing in church or I think it's more important if I usher I, I think it's more important if I preach or I think it's more important if I pray they would say, we need more singing in the church. No, 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 no. We need more preaching. We need uh, more prayer. We, we need, why can't I have more of this in the church? Or why can't you think just like me? Because if you think just like me, we'd be all on one accord. Um, it, it is, Bible says, Paul says, because when I was a child, I spoke as a child. You know what he's really telling them? He's saying that the conversations that you're having are childish. I expect this conversation from kids. But folk that's been in the church for a while, your conversation ought to be a little bit more than, I like it better when he preaches and I wish they would lead praise. Your conversation ought to have grown from I'm only coming to church if the correct elements are in place. Your, your, your maturity ought to grow more than uh, if, if such and such ain't preaching, I ain't coming to church or if such and such ain't that. No, no, no. No, no, no. Paul says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. That's stuff your kids should be saying. So, so watch this. Oh, this is good. In the midst of all this arguing and bickering and gossip and backbiting, Paul shows up in verse 13, chapter 13, it says this. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, all I am is a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. You ain't got it yet. He said, if I have Watch this, watch, watch this Adventist. If I have the gift of prophecy, oh, it's quiet in here. That's all right. It's tight, it's tight, but it, it's tight, but it's right. It's tight, but it's right. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, if I have faith, watch this. If I got faith so that when I speak to a mountain, it starts edging and moving, but I'm nasty to people. If I help Tracy out in community service, that's what the text said. Feed the poor. That's community service. Okay. If I deliver my body to be burned, but don't have love. Can you tell you ain't talked to your neighbor yet? Can you nudge somebody and say, I gotta have more love? Nope, that was the wrong neighbor. That, that was the wrong neighbor. Can you find one that say, I gotta have more love? Watch, watch this. I ain't got much. Watch this. Be, because love is patient. Okay, I, I, just, I, I just realized it. I just realized it. The reason we can't often get along as church family 
is because for some reason, even though we have issues, we have a problem dealing with other people who have the same issues we got. For some reason, y'all help me, please help me. I ain't the smartest person in the box. Even though we got a lot of issues, when other people have the same issues we have, it then becomes a problem. Okay, okay, you didn't catch it yet. Patience means to suffer long or be long-suffering. Okay. In the context of this verse... Watch this. Come in, Nathan. Watch this. Watch this. Ooh. In the context of this verse, patience means to exercise understanding and tolerance toward people who are under the weight of circumstances. Put this thing on you. He, 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 says, he, he says here, if folk are not under something, they ain't really patience. He says you start exercising patience when you find people who are under the weight of sin and instead of judging them, you reach out your arms to love them. How dare we in the body of Christ and you see a soul that is steeped under the weight and the guilt and the misfortune, whether or not they put themselves in the situation. They're suffering under the weight and Paul says that when you really love somebody, instead of talking about what they didn't do you reach your arms around and love them why after all ain't that what Jesus did for you oh y'all ain't talking to me today ain't that what Jesus did for you I don't it's not that what Jesus did for you is there anybody in here that was found under the weight of sin and under the weight of guilt and if people knew what you really was like they wouldn't even let you come in the church but Jesus in his infant love stretched out his arms and said I'm gonna love you anyway am I the only one who's been under the weight of circumstances and the guilt of your past will overwhelm you like a flood and you feel like giving up. But Jesus comes and says, they don't love you, but I'm still going to love you. And Jesus says, when you're in a church family, you start having patience when you love people that are jacked up. You know how easy it is to love people you like? You, you know when you really start growing with God? When you got people in your life that are just annoying. Like when you see them coming, Lord, give me patience. Lord, give patience me power Lord please help me <sighs> and when they come in your presence you don't say too many words you only say as much as you need to to hurry them along hi you right. But God says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. But now that I've grown up, instead of looking at somebody with disdain, because of how Jesus has dealt with my sorry self, instead of, instead of bemoaning them, I reach out and say, I love you. Yeah, touch somebody and say, I got to grow up. No, you sound like, no, 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 no. Say, I got to grow up. Because, because watch this, I've seen with my own eyes church family who will look down on people that are in jacked up situations. I know some, listen, sometimes we put ourselves in bad situations. Come on, come on, talk to me. Come on, talk to me. Come on, you should have broke up with Bam Bam five years ago. And now he's beating on you. And now you're upset. 
But the folk talking about you, talk, see, I know, I, I told you Bam Bam was going to hit her. Check out his name, girl. I knew he was going to hit you. And, and, so, and so sometimes, sometimes we put ourselves in situation. But the text is saying it doesn't matter why they're in it based on how your response should be to them. Yo, it's so easy to love people you like. Why do you got to sit on my road today? It's other seats. Why couldn't they just go in the overflow? Happy, happy Sabbath. <sighs> so you can't even worship God because you're more concerned that somehow the sin that's on their life is going to jump out on you. But let me give you a case, honey. You already messed up yourself. Hey, listen, listen, the Apostle Paul says we got to grow up so that when people who are under the weight of sin and under the weight of the devil, you got to reach your arms out and love them because if you don't love them back to Jesus, they might not get back. Okay, okay. How many of you got love back into the arms of Jesus? You wasn't even thinking about Jesus last year. You wasn't even at church last year this time. You was at home watching TV, eating a bowl of Fruit Loops. But an old mother was somewhere praying for you. And the reason why you're here today is not because you're cute and you're, and you're Easter best, but because somebody was praying. You woke up one morning, I'm going to just go to church today. Hey, listen, sometimes in church we can mean well, but sometimes we just downright mean. Listen, newsflash, newsflash, this ain't your church. This ain't my church. This is the church of the living God. So it's not your job to try to protect or defend something that don't even belong to you when you have the propensity to mess it up anyway. What God is calling you is to a higher level of commitment, and that is how you treat other people. Watch this. The way you treat other people is synonymous to your relationship with God. That's Bible. First John. First John. How can you say you love God who you ain't never seen, but you mean the people that you see every day? The Bible says you're a liar. Don't think that you can be mean and nasty and not patient with people and God is pleased with you. Oh, well, they shouldn't have done that. Neither should you. Has God, listen, has God been patient to anybody? Come on, some of y'all lying right now in church. Has he been patient with you? Has he been long-suffering with you? Has he been enduring with you? Somebody talk to me today. Has he, has he bared long with you when you keep doing the same thing over and over and over? Is there anybody here that is thankful on this weekend that Jesus got up and is patient with you? Okay, okay. Okay, I got one more. I got one more, then I'm done. He said, love is patient. I'm just going to give you two. He says, um, love does not brag. Okay, can I, can I teach for a couple seconds? The, the word in the Greek means to always talk about who you are and what you have. It means to be drunk with pride. It, it's, a, it's a thinking that you are better than everyone you come in contact with. Watch this. Watch this. Thank you, Dr. Jones. When you always think that you're better than someone, it will upset you when others fail to realize the something better you think you are. Come back. When you always think that you're better than someone else, it will upset you when others fail to recognize 
the something better that you think you are. Can I continue? When you think you're better than others, you will always be jealous of how God is blessing other people. Be because, because when you think you're better than other people, others usually view others as less deserving of the blessings. Come back. When you think you're better than other people, you'll always be jealous when other people get blessed because other people are always less deserving than you. Oh, it's quiet in here today. Can I keep going? When you think you're better than others, you will always aspire to church positions that you aren't spiritually qualified for. Can I go on? When you think you're better than other people, you will always want to be served when in fact you are the one that should be serving. When you always think you're better than other people, Lord have mercy, you will think that you're indispensable, all important, necessary, a must have, and that the church can't function without you. When you always think you're better than other people, you will always feel that people will have to jump through hoops just to get to know who you are. When you always think you're better than other people, whew, I should stop now. You will always feel that the church cannot move unless you're in power. But I hear God saying in my head that we become too arrogant and self-involved in church because he says in his word, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We got more degrees in church than a thermometer, but no more power than a bicycle. Because we spend our time in childish behavior instead of talking about what really matters and that's Jesus listen listen and I'm, I'm done Carl listen it's time out for us to be steeped in childish conversation and grow up to the point that your Sabbath lunch conversation elevates more than what the preacher uh, did or what so and so is sleeping with or what's going on with them over here when are we going to get to the old time days when folk just used to talk about Jesus all day and what Jesus because after all what, what's going on with such and such don't bring power listen when is the last time you just sat around and talked about Jesus? When, when's the last time you shared your testimony about how he saved you and how you was a wretch undone, but instead we become so childish that our spirituality has gotten to the point that we talk about the mess and the foolishness inside the church than the Jesus that saved us. And, I, and I'm realizing... I'm realizing as pastor that oftentimes the church cannot move forward because the power of love that's needed to push it is stifled by the power of self. Listen, there is no power in you or me to save anybody. If that was true, more people would get saved. But it's all about Jesus. After all, isn't that a good topic to talk about? After all, isn't that a good topic to talk about? 
isn't it better to talk about Jesus than about who's sleeping with who and why they did this and why they cheated on this and why they got more money this time and then no 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 the only thing that brings power is the name of Jesus it's a great topic to talk about, the name of Jesus. The, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What has he done in your life? He saved your soul. What has he done in your life? He's made you whole. What has he done in your life? He's restored your marriage. What has he done in your life? He's brought your child back home. What has he done in your life? He's gave you a thirst and hungering for righteousness. Talk about Jesus. There is a name I love to call. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. It's not about you and how much degrees we have and how I'm doing this and how much such and such is going on. It's about Jesus, the sweet. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he saved me when I didn't want to, I wasn't even thinking about him. I wasn't even, my mind wasn't knowing him. But the Bible says, even while I was yet a sinner, he died. You ought to stand to your feet if you're thankful for Jesus. Come on, st stop. Listen, stop rehashing people's past. You know why? Because not even God does that. When you start bringing up folk past, it is an indication that a, that a demonic spirit is at work because God does not bring up your past, the devil does. There is a name I love to hear. I love, oh, come on, you ought to sing it a little better than that. Oh, it's. Come on, church. Oh, come on. You want to ring it up? Oh, how, how I love Jesus. Oh, 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 how. Come on. It's a good thing to talk about. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because. Come on. There is a name. Come on, church. There is. You ought to get excited about the name of Jesus. Come on, be thankful he got up for you. Oh, it's sound. Sweetest name. Only if you believe it, sing, sing, Lord. How I It tells me of a Savior's love. It tells me of who died to set me free. Tell me of his prayer. Come on, the sinner's perfect plea. Sing it all. Come on, if you're grateful. Sing, oh, sing it, oh, how, just because, come on, sing, oh, oh, sing, oh, oh, how, oh, how I love him, oh, how, Jesus, oh. Come on, let's take it out. Come on, if you really mean it. Oh, come on, if you mean it. Singing, oh, Jesus, oh, how Jesus, because he found. Come on, grab the hand of some church member. Grab the hand of some church member. Grab the hand of some church member. Come on, we got to grow up. 
We got to grow up. Paul says, when I grew up, I put away childish things. The only thing that really matters is love. And so that means if what I'm doing is not an expression of love, God ain't pleased with it. So, sometimes you don't have to say anything to people. Sometimes all they need is a hug. Sometimes all they need is a, I'm praying for you. Come on, grab the hand of somebody. Father, in the name of Jesus. We're grabbing hands now because we are all symbolically down at the altar right now. All of us in this church, all who stand right now, upstairs, downstairs, here on the pulpit, Kuala, we're all standing symbolically down at the altar because all of us at some place in time in our life have misrepresented Jesus. We have said things we have done things, we have not done things that has misrepresented the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're confessing today, saying, I'm sorry. Please forgive us. We shouldn't have said that. We shouldn't have. What we said did not. What we did did not. What we didn't do did not bless the body of Christ. And we're asking for forgiveness. And, and Lord, while we pray, we're asking you to fill us with the Holy Ghost. Maybe we need to go somebody at the conclusion of service and say, listen, would you forgive me? I didn't mean to say that. That wasn't my intention. Father, we ask that we be filled by your spirit so that the ministry of this church would not have to remain on a childish level because we keep doing childlike things. But fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Because sometimes people don't want God because of how God profess people act. And we need the power of the Holy Ghost. In fact, your word says that the power that you raised Jesus with from the grave is the same power that you want to infuse in our lives. Give us resurrection power not to sing better, not to preach better, not to usher better, not to do ministry better. Give us power to live right. Give us power to talk right. Give us power to hush our mouths when we want to speak. And give us power to open up our mouths and say a word on the behalf of the name of Jesus Christ. Give us power most of all so that when you come, you will recognize us as people that you have poured your spirit in. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you hug somebody and say,